Welcome. Um, today's lecture will focus on the electronic spectrum of transition metal complexes and how to uh, assign the peaks in the spectrum um, but using uh, uh, the so-called Tanabe Sugano diagrams. Our goal is to understand what this diagram is. Uh, this is a really complicated correlation diagram, so we're going to spend uh, most of our time explaining um, how to read this diagram and um, how this diagram was derived. After that, uh, we're going to look at one example to, uh, as to assign peaks uh, in the UV-Vis absorption spectrum using this, uh, using this correlation diagram. The required, the required readings are in chapter 11.3. All right, uh, this tanabe sugano diagram is basically a correlation diagram uh, that shows the evolution of energy levels um, of transition metal complexes from weak to strong metal ligand interactions. <clears throat> uh, basically, it shows how the energy of the system and I want to emphasize is the energy of the system, not the energy of the electronic uh, of, of the electrons. It shows how the energy uh, the energies of the system changes as you change the strength of ligand metal interaction. Um, the diagram <clears throat> depends on a number of things, and in particular, um, it depends on the particular uh, coordination geometry and the number of d electrons in the complex. Um, we're going to look at one example in a moment. Uh, I just want to tell you in advance that each line in the diagram um, represents an energy level of the whole system. Okay. All right. <clears throat> this page shows the tanabe sugano diagram for D2 system for OH complex, so it's an ML6 complex. It's a rather complicated <coughs> uh, line diagram, and uh, we're going to look at each part of it um, uh, in, in small steps. Okay. So the basic idea here is you look at <coughs> all the possible uh, term symbols uh, in the uh, OH complex having two D electrons. And on the left, um, what we consider are only electron-electron interactions. Uh, on the left are basically free metal ions in vacuum. There's no ligand at all. On the right-hand side, <coughs> we consider only ligand metal interactions. On the extreme right-hand side, we do not consider any electron-electron interaction. Now, uh, all the spaces in between are um, combination of the two interactions are both considered. So in between, we consider both electron-electron interaction and ligand metal interaction. And also from left to right, we gradually increase the degree of ligand metal interactions. All right, now we're going to uh, look at each part of the, uh, uh, the diagram in more details. All right, let's look at the very left. Uh, as you may notice, those are the term symbols that we discussed in the previous lecture. Now, what are those term symbols and where they are coming from? Those term symbols are all the possible energy levels for D2 system. So if you do the, uh, the big table thing we did last time in, in lecture, you will be able to derive five and only five term symbols for D2 system. And those five term symbols are uh, singlet S, singlet D, singlet G, triplet P, and a triplet F. Now those term symbols uh, represent five different energy levels for the whole D2 ion if we consider electron-electron interaction. Now, those five term symbols, as you may notice, are organized in particular sequence in the vertical direction. And the bottom one is a triplet F. Okay. This is the ground state of, uh, of a D2 ion. And the, 
the way to determine the ground state is uh, outlined on the left. Uh, it's the so-called Hans rule for determining the ground state of, uh, of a multi-electron system. Uh, the rule is pretty simple. It has three components. Uh, first of all, uh, you want to identify uh, the state having the highest spin multiplicity. So in this case, we have singlets and triplets. So the uh, ground state should be a triplet. Now we have two states having triplet uh, multiplicity, uh, triplet P and triplet F. Uh, in this case, we go to rule number two. If multiple states having uh, the same multiplicity, then we pick the state having the largest L. So in this case, would be uh, triplet F. Okay. Um, we did not discuss uh, J uh, value, um, but if you uh, if you consider the energy levels of the system in a magnetic field, uh, you will have to uh, consider the J value. The J value uh, of the system can, can take a lot of uh, different uh, possibilities, uh, all the way from L plus S uh, to L plus S minus 1, L plus S minus 2, all the way to the absolute value of L minus S. Uh, as shown in the bottom left. <clears throat> now, uh, if uh, you have to consider J value, then for subshells that are less than half felt, uh, the state having the lowest J value uh, will be the ground state. Uh, for subshells that are more than half felt, then the state having the highest J value uh, should be the uh, ground state. Uh, for subshells that are exactly half felt, uh, there's only one J value. All right, so um, if you follow the Hans rule, uh, as I just showed you, that um, you will end up um, picking triplet F as the ground state. Uh, now, I have to um, warn you that uh, the Hans rule is only good at picking the ground state. It does not give you any prediction about uh, the relative energy value of all the excited states. Uh, as you see here, um, the, the uh, first excited state is not triplet P, rather it's singlet D. Okay, so keep this in mind. You can use Hans rule to pick the ground state, but the excited states are too complicated to be predicted by any simple rules. Uh, rather, they have to be determined by high-level quantum calculation. All right, so um, to summarize in, uh, the information on this slide, at the very left, we basically have all the term symbols we have, we have seen um, in, the, uh, in the previous uh, lectures. And those term symbols are derived by using the exact table approach that we have tried. And the only new information here is which state is the ground state. All right, uh, now on the extreme right-hand side, uh, you also uh, see uh, three energy levels. And those three energy levels are labeled uh, differently. Uh, they're labeled as T2G2, T2GEG, and EG2. And you may recognize that those are the energy levels of the two electron system, this D2 system, if you do not consider any electron-electron interaction, um, but you do consider ligand metal interaction. Okay, so what this means is that in the presence of strong ligand metal interaction, the d orbitals split into T2G and the EG star levels. And in this case, if you do not consider electron-electron interaction, then the energetics of the system will only depend on where the electrons are populated um, in whether in TG, T2G orbitals or EG orbitals. Okay. So uh, shown on the right, if two electrons are populated onto T2G orbitals, it doesn't matter whether they are same spin or different spin, they will have the same energy because in this case we do not consider electron-electron interaction. And you also recognize that this T2G2 level should be the ground state of the system. Okay. Now the first excited state will naturally be T2G EG. Here the star is neg uh, neglected. And the second excited state will be EG2. Okay. 
again, this is the case because we do not consider electron electron here. So whether those two electrons are uh, parallel in spin, anti-parallel in spin, whether they are in the same orbitals or different orbitals, it doesn't matter because electron electron interactions are not considered. And the only uh, interaction we are considering is the ligand metal interaction, which splits the d orbitals into two levels, eg star and t2g. All right, now we're coming to the most challenging part of this diagram. Um, these are the, uh, the, the levels in the middle. Uh, so let's look at the left-hand side first. And what you see here are <clears throat> um, basically the effect of introducing ligand metal interaction to the free metal ion. And the result of that is um, you're going to break the uh, original symmetry of the metal ion. Originally, the metal ion has a spherical symmetry. But once you bring in six uh, ligands and creating an OH um, uh, environment, the symmetry is going to be totally different. Okay. And as a result of this change of uh, symmetry, the original five term symbol levels um, becomes more levels, and those levels have different energies. And those levels are labeled with their multiplicity. As you can see, there are singlets and triplets on the upper left corner of those symbols. And also, uh, they're labeled with their symmetry uh, in, their, uh, in the OH environment. Uh, those symbols are essentially uh, the so-called irreducible representations um, in the uh, OH uh, character table. Um, this is something that we did not discuss in this lecture, um, but I just want to uh, let you know where those symbols are coming from. All right, on the right-hand side, you see a similar pattern um, that the, uh, the three levels, um, T2G2, T2GEG, and EG2, um, split into more levels uh, having different energies. Um, this effect is the result of introducing electron-electron interaction uh, into, uh, into those three levels. And uh, uh, one thing I want to point out is that uh, from left to right, the only difference is how much ligand metal interaction you are introducing. Okay. So on the left, you introduce a little bit of metal ligand interaction. On the right, there's a lot more ligand metal interaction. So in another word, the relative magnitude of electron-electron interaction and ligand metal interactions changes from left to right. As a result of that, uh, the relative positions of those energy levels changes as you move from right. But despite those changes, you notice that the number and the type of uh, energy levels are exactly the same. You do not create new levels. You do not um, eliminate those levels. Uh, the symbols and symmetry, the symmetry of those levels are exactly the same, whether it's on the left or on the right. The last thing I want to point out is that uh, in this particular system, uh, there are two different spins or multiplicity uh, for, all the, for all the levels. Uh, there are singlets and triplets. Uh, as you can see, those states having the same multiplicity are labeled uh, using the same kind of lines. All right, you may wonder why there are so many levels out there and uh, why their energetics goes up and down the way it is. Okay, so uh, to just give you an example, let's look at uh, one of the uh, levels here. Uh, so let's focus on uh, the triplet F level here. Now the triplet F level um, splits into three more levels uh, in the OH environment. Now what this means is that uh, the triplet F um, in the free ion state, it behaves just like an F electron. Okay? So F electron, um, you may recognize, has seven different uh, orbitals. So uh, when you place an F electron into an OH environment, 
depending on its orientation, the uh, seven uh, orbitals will be well split into three different levels because they have three different symmetries. And this is exactly what a multi-electron system will do uh, because uh, the F triplet state behaves just like an F electron would do um, mathematically in the OH environment. Uh, so uh, using the same analogy, you can look at what happens to the D singlet state. Um, you may notice that it splits into EG singlet and T2G singlet. You may recognize this is the, exactly the same T2G EG splitting we already discussed in the, um, in the uh, ligand field theory. So uh, going back to the triplet F, um, it produces, it splits into three states, A, um, A2G triplet, T2G triplet, and T1G triplet. And this uh, three levels um, produce different uh, changes upon increasing ligand metal interaction. You may notice that the T1G triplet goes down in energy but the A2G triplet goes up in energy. Now why is that? Okay. To explain this, you can look at the diagram on the left. Now in the original uh, F triplet um, system, if you think about all the possible microstates, okay, uh, it involves a lot of microstates having two electrons in parallel spin. Uh, so I just sketch two of the many possible microstates on the left in the red bracket. And uh, in the absence of any metal ligand interaction, all the 5D orbitals have the same energy. So in this case, whether I place the two electrons on the left 2D orbitals or the middle 2D orbitals would be the same. And what that means is those microstates will have the same energy and they will be energetically degenerated. Now, what happens if you introduce a little bit of ligand metal interaction? What I learned so far is that the ligand metal interaction will split the energy of the d orbitals into two. Two of the d orbitals will become the EG star level and three of them will become the T2G uh, level. So, with this change, you may recognize that where the original two electrons are located becomes important. Okay? Now, if the two electrons were located in the two, uh, two of the T2G energy levels, then as you gradually increase the electron uh, elect, uh, ligand metal interaction, this, uh, the level associated with this microstate will go down in energy because the, uh, the T2G level um, goes down in energy, relatively speaking, we will increase the ligand metal interaction. However, okay, so that is the case uh, shown in this uh, green block, green box. Okay. However, on the other hand, if you have the two electrons originally populated onto the D orbitals that end up in the EG level, and for those microstates, their energy will go up if you increase the ligand metal interaction because EG star level is anti-bonding. A stronger ligand metal interaction will push the anti-bonding orbital up. And that eventually um, pushes the microstates up and become associated with the EG2 level, uh, which is the second excited state in the extreme of strong ligand metal interaction. All right, now once we uh, <coughs> figure out how the diagrams are uh, produced, uh, we can uh, reorganize the diagram a little bit and uh, we, can, we can also use high-level quantum calculation to calculate exactly what those energy levels will be, uh, would be at particular level of uh, ligand metal interaction. And those kind of quantitative uh, diagrams are shown on the, uh, on the right hand side. The left and the right hand side are actually the same kind of diagram except the one on the right is quantitative and the one on the left is qualitative. 
the one on the right also um, levels uh, the energy of uh, T1G triplet, which is the ground state of the system. And you notice that all other energy levels are plotted relative to that ground state. And this is meaningful because in a lot of uh, the uh, applications of this diagram, we're only interested in uh, getting the difference between energy levels, as well, uh, we will discuss in a moment. Uh, in this uh, diagram shown on the right, um, the uh, ligand metal interaction are uh, expressed in the unit of delta O um, over B. And B, you can simply um, know that uh, it's a constant uh, that um, describes the electron-electron uh, repulsion. Uh, on the vertical axis, it also shows the energy in the uh, unit of B as well. Um, you again see the two different lines. Um, the ground state is a triplet and is shown in a continuous line. Um, and all other triplets, uh, in this case, states having the same multiplicity with the ground state are shown in the same kind of line. And all other multiplicity systems are shown in, uh, in dotted lines. All right, now we have understood how the correlation diagram uh, was prepared. The next question is, uh, what can we do with it? Uh, what, what kind of information does it provide and uh, what kind of problem can the correlation diagram help us to solve? Uh, one of the most popular and important applications of, uh, of the correlation diagram is to uh, help us assign and understand uh, the uh, uv vis absorption spectrum of transition metal complex. An example is shown here on the bottom right, uh, which is the uv vis absorption spectrum of vanadium-3 plus um, uh, hydrated ion. So this is a D2 system. Now we have to introduce uh, some uh, quantum mechanics background. Uh, this is the this is related to the selection rules uh, governing the uh, DD transition. Uh, there are two rules, basically. The first one says that the transitions between states of the same parity uh, are forbidden. Uh, parity basically means symmetry with respect to the uh, inversion center. The second rule says that transitions between states of different multiplicity are forbidden. Okay. So within the context of um, uh, transition metal complexes, the first rule basically ruled out all transitions between states um, uh, of, uh, of D electrons. And the reason being all D states um, are symmetrical with respect to the inversion center. Uh, you may think about uh, the shape of the D orbitals. You may recognize that all of them are symmetrical with respect to the inversion center. So what this means is that according to the first rule, uh, you cannot have an uh, electronic transition between uh, states uh, made from uh, D electrons because all those states would carry and inherit the symmetry of the D orbitals. And you can see that uh, clearly in the uh, correlation diagram. You find uh, there's a subscript uh, G in all those states and G basically tells you that those states are symmetrical with respect to inversion operation. Now. Now, in reality, uh, the rules are, uh, are broken uh, due to a lot of reasons, and uh, one of them being the uh, vibration of the, uh, of the coordination bond. Uh, this kind of vibration will temporarily break uh, the OH symmetry, and that uh, makes the transition uh, allowed momentarily. Uh, so the overall effect of the first rule basically is to uh, make the DD transition, which is transition from D levels to another D level, uh, extremely weak uh, compared to uh, other allowed transitions. Now the second rule uh, is um, also um, imposing restrictions to possible DD transitions. And this rule says um, that uh, transitions between different multiplicities are forbidden. So this makes the transition from the ground state uh, to the states having the same mul multiplicity, um, the more prominent uh, absorption uh, transitions. 
and that's actually one of the reasons we uh, label uh, the levels having the same multiplicity with the ground state using the same kind of line. All right, now if you look at uh, the diagram on the top left, um, you may notice that uh, from the ground state, which is uh, triplet T1G, uh, there are three possible excited states. Uh, the first one being triplet T2G, second one being triplet T1G, and third one being triplet A2G. So uh, at room temperature, the system should be in uh, triplet T1G state because that's the ground state. When a photoabsorption uh, happens, uh, there are three possible uh, excitations. They're labeled as uh, V1, V2, and V3 in the diagram. And what this means is that you should expect three peaks uh, in the UVVIS absorption spectrum of the D2 ion. Now, the reality is that uh, you only see two peaks uh, because the third one is actually in the deep UV region uh, that is blocked by uh, ligand metal um, uh, ligand to metal uh, uh, charge transfer band. Um, but in any case, uh, in this um, in this example, uh, the, you can label the first peak at around 550 nanometers uh, to T1G to T2G transition, uh, both triplets, and the second peak at about 400 nanometers to uh, T1G triplet. Uh, to T1G triplet transition. Uh, so that corresponds to the V2 transition in the diagram. All right, so that will conclude our discussion today. Um, as a uh, homework, uh, I'd like you to uh, look at this collection of uh, UVVIS absorption spectrum. Uh, you can find the same data on the text. Uh, I'd like you to find the corresponding uh, tanabe sugano diagram and using those diagrams to, uh, uh, to assign the UVVIS absorption peaks to a particular DD transition in the diagram. All right, uh, see you on Wednesday.